Welcome to session number two. Well, basically, what we're going to do in this second session will be to put into practice what Andrea just explained. So, we're going to see why it's background knowledge so important. Well, if I show you the words the Eiffel Tower, what comes to your mind? Well, let me tell you that uh, your mind will recall what you know about it. If you have been in Paris, maybe you will remember how the day was, the people you were with, but if you have only seen it in pictures or on the TV, that's only something that, I mean, that's all that you remember, okay? Now, let me tell you that um, it is an automatically process we do, however, there is a process, it, the reading it's a process, so it starts with the pre-reading part, then a while reading, and finally the post reading. We are going to go over them and see what are the differences. In the pre-reading part, basically what we do is that we predict what the reading is going to be about. So I am going to show you later on some strategies that you can use in order to find out um, how to do this. Then we move to the while reading in which we actually read the text and confirm our predictions. And finally, we move to the integration part, which is a post reading part. And in this um, section, what we do is that we incorporate into our schemata uh, the new knowledge and it becomes meaningful and part of our language. Now, let's talk about some of the pre-reading um, strategies that we could use. They might sound very, uh, let's say, normal or something you do all the time. However, they are reading strategies, okay? So whenever you are going to read a text, one of my recommendations at first is to read titles, subtitles, typographical clues, uh, know which gender are you going to be exposed to. If you have access to who wrote the text will be great. And also, uh, well, activate your background knowledge, as I told you before, try to recall whatever you know about the topic and keywords. So let's see some ideas here. Why do we have to read titles and subtitles? Well, let me show you. And Andrea is going to help me um, right now. Well, Andrea, if I show you this um, title, what do you think the reading you will read will be about? Well, for the first one, I would say it's related um, to science, maybe because we have liquid, or even to health, because we have the word breathing. And for the second one um, that says you are what you speak, maybe they will share some findings of some kind of research project. And uh, in terms of how your native language would affect how you um, approach other languages, maybe in this case, English. Very good. Great job. So as you can see, Andrea haven't even read the text, but she already has an idea what it's about. Now, so that's why don't forget to read titles and subtitles before you start. Now, let's go with the genre. This is another thing that Andrea is going to help us. And she is going to analyze the type of text she is um, looking at or reading at. So, Andre, if you look at this text I have on the screen, what do you think you're reading? What type of text? Um, I will say that for that one, uh, it sounds like either a poem or the lyrics of a song, because you can see over there that the format is different of the traditional paragraph. It's more like stanzas. Mm -hmm. And uh, we also have word repetition. Very good. Now, what about this one? Look at this one. Um, for that one, I would say that's definitely a poem. We also have that format of stanzas, which mm -hmm. is like a key characteristic of poems. And we also have sound uh, repetition, like with fail and thrill. Very good. And the last one. Uh, I would say that could be the heading of a newspaper article, maybe. Very good. So now that Andrea knows, what is, it, what is the text about, she can um, have an idea what to expect in the text. Now let's continue with the non-linguistic context, okay? Um, now, something important and to be on the same page. When we're talking about text in the reading process, we have to make sure we're, we don't think only in a written text. 
text could be a picture, a graph, um, a chart, because you can extract information from it. So that's basically reading. So we can read a picture, right? So here it's how non-linguistic content works. For example, I'm going to show you these three um, pictures. And just by looking at the pictures, I can find out how many uh, Hispanics are in the U.S. And just by looking at the graph, I can see Mexicans um, are the largest group. Okay. Then with the other picture, I get to see that there might be talking about the water cycle. And finally, with the chart, I can find out which country is the one producing more domestic waste. So if I see this and I already know what the text is going to be about, it will be easier to know what I am going to expect or read in the text. Okay. So now we are going to move to the typographical clues. For this, for this topic, we decided to do an activity. And so it's easier to understand. Um, it, it's a story about three sisters that are in love. And um, the guy didn't, didn't say who he was in love with. So they decided that um, they wanted him to confess his love to, um, to them. So what he did is that he wrote a poem. The problem with this poem is that he didn't use any punctuation marks. So let's see how it looks. By the way, we also uh, chose a poem in Spanish in order to tell you that it doesn't matter the language you're going to be working with. Could be Spanish, English, Portuguese, Japanese, whatever. Um, typographical clues will always work in the same way. So we're going to read this. It says, this is what he wrote without typographical clues. Tres bellas que bellas son, me han exigido las tres que diga de ellas cuál es la que ama mi corazón. Si obedecer es razón, diré que amo a Soledad, no a Julia, cuya bondad persona humana no tiene, no aspira mi amor a Irene, que no es poca su verdad. Wow, this was a big problem because... Each sister punctuated the poem at their own convenience. So here it's Soledad's version. Tres bellas que bellas son. Me han exigido las tres que diga de ellas cuál es la que ama mi corazón. Si obedecer es razón, diré que amo a Soledad. No a Julia, cuya bondad persona humana no tiene. No aspira mi amor a Irene, que no es poca su verdad. Hmm. This is Irene's version. Tres bellas que bellas son. Me han exigido las tres que diga de ellas cuál es la que ama mi corazón. Si obedecer es razón, ¿diré que amo a Soledad? No. ¿A Julia cuya bondad persona humana no tiene? No. Aspira mi corazón a Irene, que es poca su verdad. Que no es poca su verdad, perdón. Ok. And Julia's version. Tres bellas que bellas son. Me han exigido las tres que diga de ellas cuál es la que ama mi corazón. Si obedecer es razón, ¿diré que amo a Soledad? No, a Julia, cuya bondad persona humana no tiene. No aspira mi amor a Irene, que no es poca su verdad. But the man gave his son punctuated version as well. So let's see how it works. And this was his final version. Tres bellas que bellas son, me han exigido las tres que diga de ellas cuál es la que ama mi corazón. Si obedecer es razón, ¿diré que amo a Soledad? No. ¿A Julia cuya bondad persona humana no tiene? No. ¿Aspira mi amor a Irene? ¿Qué? No, es poca su verdad. So I think I don't have to talk much about this. And we get to see how important typographical clues are in a text. Now let's move on to the while reading strategies. In this session, we're going to be talking about the first two, context clues and connectors. And then in our third session, we are going to be talking about the effective use of the dictionary. So let's start with the context clues. Well, let me tell you, before I show you this, I'm going to tell you a little story. I remember when I started as a language learner 
and I wanted to understand every single word I was reading from the book. I was reading, right? And so I didn't understand a word and I went to the dictionary, look for the word and continue. But after 20 words, like after looking after 20 words, I was so tired. I didn't want to continue reading. Well, so guess what? I put the book away and didn't read, right? So later on, voila, I found context clues, which has been a great tool in this aspect. Let me um, share it with you so you can use it too in your reading process. Now, you do not need to know the exact meaning of a word. Be happy with knowing a close guess, okay? So authors usually, while they're writing, they give us clues of unknown words they're writing. So what do we have to do? Well, we have to we, we need to uh, learn how to decode or understand what's behind their writing. So let's see. Okay, we can start using definitions. Um, look for definitions. For example, writers may use words, phrases, or statements to define something. So let's see this example. Imagine you see the word perfluorocarbons. I might not be um, knowing what it is. So what do I do? I continue reading and what does the writer do? He writes a definition. So perfluorocarbons are liquid Teflon and are excellent carriers of the solvers. So now I have an idea what it is. Um, let's move on. Another one will be restatements. Um, restatements are words or phrases or even sentences that the writer provides um, to explain the meaning of difficult words. So for example, if we have dendrochronology, we have no idea what it is, but if we continue reading, we can see the word or that give us the idea that he's comparing. And so, ah, it's easier to understand what dendrochronology means. Let's move on to another one, which is punctuation marks. And well, we already saw a little bit of this. However, um, writers use punctuation marks um, to describe um, the meaning of unfamiliar words. So if you see the example, megafossils, we might not know what it is, but in, per, in, uh, be, in between commas, there is a definition. So large specimens of whole plants and animals. Um, and so now I know what it is, right? So punctuation marks is also used for that. And finally, we can find examples in the reading. So um, take advantage of them. We might find words such as, for example, in the example, fatty food. We might not know what it's that, but as soon as I read fatty food, such as potato chips, oh, I know what potato chips are, so I know what's a fatty food, okay? So that's why examples are also super important while reading. Now, let's practice and let me explain to you um, about this following activity. This is a little boy. He went to live to a new country and he's learning uh, this new language, okay? So he has been incorporating into his um, language the new vocabulary, so he's writing in his diary. And we are going to read this um, entry he has in his diary, and we are going to try to find out what the blue words mean, even though we don't know this new language. And Andrea is going to help us reading the um, the entry. So it says, Dear Diary, I overslept this morning. I had to eat my bowl of poof poofs very quickly and I almost missed the transam. When I got to school, I realized I had forgotten my zilping. Luckily, Miss Jitsi is very sush and told me I could bring it tomorrow. After school, some friends and I played Plingming. It's a new game I am learning. We scored seven roycals and they only scored five, so we were the zoiters. That says that next week we are going to the flatter. I can't wait. 
Love, I love to swim and play in the sand. I hope I don't get a sunburn though. Well, I better go to bed soon. I don't want to wake up late again and miss my trans am. Until tomorrow, Ryan. Thanks, Andre. So, Andre, I would like your help. And we're going to try to discover what some of the blue words mean. So, Andre, after reading, what do you think poof proofs are? I would say they could be some type of cereal because it says that you can eat it, but you can place them in a bowl and you can eat them very quickly. Oh, excellent. What about transam? I would say some type of kind of means of transportation, maybe bus or subway. Mm-hmm. And silk plink, silping? Um, that one is interesting. I would say it could be some kind of homework or project that you forget and you need to bring it to school. Oh, have that happened to you before? Uh, yes, many times. Oh, you see, background knowledge, super important. And what about sush? Uh, sush, I would say that is a positive quality. Maybe like a nice person or understanding when you have some kind of problem or difficulty. I think we'll have had a teacher like this. So it help us to understand. So I'll leave the rest of the blue words for you to guess what they are. But you see, we didn't know that language and we were able to find out what those words um, possibly mean. Okay. Um, okay. And well, these were the source we consulted. And let me give you a quote. It says, you can find magic wherever you look. Sit back and relax and you'll need, all you need, it's a book. So thanks for your attention and see you in session three.